If you have your Bibles, we're going to uh, go to Hebrews chapter 6. And we'll get there in just a few moments, but we have some, uh, some things we're going to talk about. I haven't decided if we're going to prolong this or if we're going to, we'll just wait and see what, what God does. But before we get started, I got a, a story that I found that I thought was quite amusing. And I bet you every one of you are going to fail this test. It's called the bathtub test. Anybody ever heard of the bathtub test? Great. I've, I've got some, some knowledge for you that you're going to be able to take and tell your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and maybe even those that you're, you're hanging out with. The story goes like this. It says, during a visit to a mental asylum, I asked the, the director, how do you determine whether or not a patient should be institutionalized? The doctor said, well... This is what we do. We fill up a bathtub. And after we fill up the bathtub, we offer them a teaspoon, a teacup, and a bucket. And we give this to the patient, and we ask them to empty the bathtub. This individual says, oh, I understand. Normal people would use a bucket because it's bigger than the spoon or the teaspoon. And right now, every one of you in your mind, you're, you're picturing a teaspoon in a cup, in a bucket. You said, yeah, I would use a bucket. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands which one you chose because it goes on to say the normal person would use a bucket because it's bigger than the spoon of the teacup. No, said the director. Normal person will pull the plug. What bed do you want? Do you want it near the window? And so how many of you would be near the window right now because you were saying, yeah, I would use a bucket also? You see, that's how we are sometimes, right? We, we get to the place to where we, we have... We think we have three obvious choices, but there's always another one. And I, I found that, and I thought it was kind of amusing. But I want to get you a little bit of a recap on youth camp. I'm not going to go into everything that's going on. Some of you may have seen some of these numbers that were posted on Facebook. But we always ask at the end of camp, we ask the counselors, um, well, excuse me, the, the cabin leaders, because we can't um, legally use the word counselor anymore. But we ask the cabin leaders to talk with our campers and to find out what God has done in their life. And, and with that, these are the results that happened at youth camp. At youth camp, we had, I don't know, roughly 125, 150 kids, something like that. I, can't re I don't know the exact numbers, but 28 young people were saved at youth camp. That, that, that's something to be, uh, be proud of. 35 people were restored back to their relationship with Jesus Christ. 35 people were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 28 people were healed, and 33 people said they felt the call of God on their life into the ministry. I, I don't know about you. you. You say, well, these are just numbers. This is, it isn't really important to me. But you know, when you begin to look at these kids and begin to see what God is doing in these kids, I believe that the outpouring that God gave us last Sunday was, was used this past week in youth camp. Because we had everybody, we had three, three or four counselors that were in the rooms with the kids, spending time with the kids, speaking life into the children. And I just thank God for all that he's doing. I thank God for everything that he done that week. You know, everybody says youth camp is tiring. It really isn't. You know, you have so much going on. You get up at 7 o'clock in the morning and you go to bed 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the, early in the morning. And you get up five hours later and do it again. And as you're going, you have a little bit of a low. Well, I do, right around 3 o'clock. You're like, ooh, where's that nap? And all you do is go get you a nice, strong cup of coffee, and you're ready to go. Because you never want, I will speak for myself, I never want to be in my room and not seeing what the children are doing. I never want to be taking a nap when the kids are out doing this and they're out doing that. I always want to be around seeing what God's doing and I get out there and I, I play with the kids and I was screaming so much I was I was afraid I wasn't going to have a voice today to preach but but God is it was doing what God does and we never know what we, our effect on children are going to be when we spend time with them and we get on their level and I just thank God for that so with that we're going to get into our word and I just want to say welcome to church this is a new church we, we have new members of the church uh, as it came, those that gave their life to Christ in youth camp. We have a church that's on fire, a church that's on a mission. And it's a great day to be in church. There's no better day to be in church than today. 
tomorrow, there'll be no better day to be in church until tomorrow because tomorrow will become today. And every time we get to church, it's like our mind shifts just a little bit. And some of that confusion and some of that, that, that noise leaves and we get focused for just a little bit. It's a great day to be on the winning side. And it's a great day to be on the blessed side. Can anybody say amen to that? No matter where you are in life, when you're on the side of Jesus Christ, you're always on the side of the blessing. Because we might not see the blessing now, but the blessing will come because His promises say that He will. And if He promised it, it's going to come to pass. Today, we're going to begin to talk about something I like to call an anchor. Everybody has an anchor in their life, an anchor, and we're going to be anchored, and we're going to be talking about how we're anchored to the immovable God, the eternal Father. And as we begin today, we're going to build and we'll throw our anchor on the beginning part of Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. And the Bible says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. You see, as believers, we're encouraged to remain steadfast and committed in our faith through every trial and every storm that life may bring. We are anchored by Jesus. He is our great hope. He is our salvation. And he is our Savior. As we begin to, to move forward, we begin to look at this verse. And, and we see that this is just the first part of the verse. But that's the power of God's word. Sometimes you don't have to read to the, to the, the, the period at the end of the sentence. You can stop right there in the middle. And you can see how God is already speaking to you. This is the power of the Bible. The living word of God. It speaks to us in every season of our life if you don't believe that think back in every circumstance that you went through the word of God was there with you every ounce of suffering that you went through the word of God was there every victory that you was able to celebrate it was because of the word of God coming to life in your life it is the word of God the Bible is truly an amazing thing it is something that that we can hope in it's something that we're going to take away today and maybe the next couple of weeks. And we're going to reignite and renew the interest in Scripture. How many of you ever open up your Bible to read your daily devotions? Or, or you realize after dinner you haven't read your Bible yet because you're so busy. And you begin to open it. And as you begin to open it, you open it to a place where you've already read a, a thousand times. And you say, I know what's going on. And you get about three or four verses into the story or the passage and you close it because you've got something else going on or, or, or doesn't grab you. My prayer is that we begin to understand that the Word of God is so alive that it can change us. And all we have to do is persevere through these things. You see, we're going to begin to talk about anchors. And, and anchors are very interesting objects. They come in different shapes, different sizes, different weights, but they all do the same thing. They hold things in place. You see, a lot of us think about boat anchors like I have on the screen here. But how many of you ever used a wall anchor? We, you go to put something in, in drywall that behind it, there's nothing. It's just hollow. It cannot hold up weight. And so we, we place a wall anchor in there. And as it does, it grabs hold of that void that we have placed. It grabs hold of those that empty place. And now you're able to hang things on it. You're able, some of these anchors that are going to drywall can hold 100 pounds. And, and if you try to do that without it, it's going to come right out. Anchors hold things in place. You see, boat anchors, there, there's many different styles and types depending on what you're using it for. You're not going to get an extremely heavy boat anchor for just a, a small fishing boat. You're not going to put one of these anchors that's on one of these, these uh, battleships that the Navy has on one of these little John boats. It's, it'll take the John boat right over and it'll flip it. Anchors are used for, for different occasions and for different things, but it is used to hold. An anchor is an amazing invention. Used by fishermen and sailors for hundreds or even thousands of years. And the basic concept of an anchor is it's a device normally made of metal used to secure a vessel to the bed of a body of water to prevent the craft from drifting due to wind and to current. And you see, if you stay right there, you can use that definition and grab some scriptures and you can have a sermon all by yourself. 
Because we're talking about being anchored to Jesus Christ. And as we're talking about being anchored to Jesus Christ, the one thing that will happen in your life is the winds are going to blow against you and try to knock you off course. The current of society will try to pull you away from the cross. And the only way you are not pulled away from that cross is to be anchored to Jesus Christ. And when you throw your anchor to Jesus, he will hold you firm and strong steadfast and you will not waver you will not turn when you begin to keep your eyes upon Jesus Christ an anchor is simple in design but it is very powerful think about an anchor think about how small of a proportion its weight is to the vessel that it's holding still just think about that for a moment it doesn't Equal the weight of the vessel. But it is designed in a way that it would hold it still. As believers, we're encouraged to remain steadfast and committed in our faith through every trial and storm that life may bring. We are anchored, if you will, in hope, like the Scripture says. And as you may have guessed, that hope is Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ alone. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. It says, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so you, your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You see, an anchor is very simple. It's a device. It has no electronics to it. It has no batteries you have to put on it. It's simple. And we have to get to the point that we have to understand our relationship with Jesus Christ is simple. But yet we allow Satan to come in. We allow Satan and all the world to begin to make it so difficult that we get confused and we leave the simplicity that it is in Christ. We have all of these things that we have to do. We have all of those things that we have to do. One Bible commentator said an anchor was an ancient Christian symbol for safety, security, and hope. It may be found on the walls of the Roman catacombs. Whenever they would die and you would go in there, you would, you would see pictures of anchors. We have to understand that anchors are always going to be there. But as we begin to look at this verse, what are we talking about? What is this specific hope that the author of Hebrews is referring to in verse 19? We have to read the text in full. If you have your Bibles, we're going to Hebrews 6. We're going to read verses 13 through 19. It says, when God made his promise to Abraham... Since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all arguments. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm as a cure to enter into the inner sanctuary behind the curtains. We have to understand that God in this text, there's three things we're going to talk about. And the first one is this, trusting the promises of God. You know, you maybe have, have prayed your whole life and you never received a promise from God in your prayer. Maybe he's never spoken to you, but every promise that you need is found in his word. Every promise you need is found in his scriptures. And those promises that he promised back then are the promises that he still answers and abides by today. If he promised Abraham, he's going he's gonna to fulfill it in your life. You have to understand that just because you didn't get a specific promise from God, every promise in his word is for every believer. God made a promise to Abraham. And the scripture says, because he couldn't swear by anything greater, he swore by himself. It says, I will surely bless you. You know, we have to think back to promises in our life. 
You know, it's always good thinking about those promises people kept, but I bet you you think about those promises people broken more than you thought about those that people have kept. You know, today is kind of funny because you don't have to word, use the word promise. You can be in that simple conversation, and just because it was a conversation, somebody else is going to take it as a promise that you had to follow through with, and you never had an intention of doing that. You're just talking to somebody. You know, if you begin to look at promises broken, all you have to do is, is look no farther than Exodus, and you see Pharaoh. Time after time after time through conversation, he broke his promise to Moses. One player came and he said, I'm going to let them go so you can go worship. That day came and he said, I'm not letting them go. Another player came and it went on and on and on until they got to the point where God says, I'm going to make it a way to where he would never be able to say no again. And we know that he took the firstborn. And as he took the firstborn, Pharaoh threw everybody out of Egypt. And as he threw them out, they took all of the, the good stuff, all the, the wealth with them. But Pharaoh began to say, you know what? I want to break that promise. And he came after Israel. And you saw what happened to Pharaoh. In our lives, there are going to be promises that are going to be broken. But aren't you glad that you serve a God that keeps his promise even to the smallest detail? There is nothing that God will not do. If he said he will do it, he's going to do it. Our God is a promise keeper. At the end of the day, he has kept every promise, and he has fulfilled every prophecy up until this point. Obviously, there's, there's still some more to come. But the point is right here. God has come through every single time. There is nothing. and We have to understand just because we pray a prayer, does not mean God is going to answer it. We have to pray according to his will. God, I'm praying according to your will. Now, I'm going to let you know my heart. You already know it, but I'm going to speak it out of my mouth. This is what I would love, God. This is what I need. But, Father, I need your will done. But you know my heart. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we have to understand that. We have to know that he, he is there. He was there then. He was there now. He's going to be there tomorrow. He's always going to be there, and he's always going to fulfill his word. He is not going through a midlife crisis. He is not going on some crazy journey where he doesn't have time for you. Every one of us get to a place in, in God, in our relationship with God, or maybe even in our personal relationships. We get busy. I don't want to deal with that. Anybody ever got that phone call from somebody you know needed your help? You're like, you know what? I know what they're calling for, and I really don't want to do it right now. I'm just going to let it go to voicemail. If they leave me a detailed voicemail, I'm going to listen to it, and then I'll go. But if they don't leave that voicemail, even though you know what's going on, I'm not going. What would it be like if God had voicemail? What would it be, God? Like, oh, man, there's Jacob again. He's so needy. All he's doing is ask this, ask that, ask this, ask that. Uh, let it go to my voicemail, and I'll, I'll get back to it later. There's some, there's some more important things. Sometimes we feel like that with God because he's not answering our prayers right now. But I'm telling you right now, God listens to you, and he hears every word that you said. He hears every, he sees every tear that, that drops from your eyes. He knows your heart, and he says, if you would just stay the course, I am here, and I will touch. I promised I will never leave you, nor forsake you, and I'm going to give you the best things in life that you need. All you have to do is stay the course. He's not going through all this. He remains the same, and this is the incredible good news in, in a world that is constantly changing and constantly moving moving you think about it from when you was a kid to where we are now everything changes fads come and fads go everything changes but there's one thing that is constant that constant is jesus christ that constant is his word that constant is he is here and he will never leave you and he will never forsake you he hears your prayers he hears your cries and all you have to do is stay anchored to him and allow him to take you through the storm that was a good place to scream right there. Listen to what Hebrews 6 and 18 says in the Amplified. So that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, 
in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and indwelling strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. What is this hope that is set before us? Who is this that has fled to him for refuge? Those of us that have understood who Jesus Christ was and we gave ourselves to him as we asked him to come into our hearts and we have surrendered our lives to him. We believe in everything that you say, God. We believe in everything that you've done, Jesus, and we are coming to you. We are coming to hold you. You are our refuge. You are the one that our hope is in. You're the one that's going to sustain us when everything else goes bad. This is what we are. And, and it says the two unchangeable things. God's promise in his oath. In which it's impossible for God to lie. Do you understand what the, what the author is saying here? It's impossible for God to lie. We, 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 we can't fathom that because we have the choice to tell the truth or to lie. Sometimes we do half and half depending on what's going on. But the Bible says it's impossible, which means if it comes out of his mouth, it's absolute truth. And if it's absolute truth, there is absolutely nothing else that can stand against it. There's nothing else that can challenge it because if he spoke it, it's here. And if it's here, it's here to stay. And we have to understand what that is. I had a, I had a guy on Facebook saying, what is truth? And every time you said to, I didn't even, he didn't even try to respond to him because I began to understand what he was doing. And everything you said, he would come back at you and say, what is this? What is that? This is what truth is. I don't care if you're a Christian. I don't care if you're a sinner, if you're a heathen, if you're filled with devils. Here's the truth. The truth and the absolute truth is this. Jesus Christ was here before everything else. He's going to be here when everything is gone. He is the absolute truth. There is no rival in him. There's nobody that can stand up against him. If he said it, that's what he meant. And if he meant it, he's going to hold it to pass. And he's promised and his oath is always there and changeable and impossible to lie. The truth is whatever this book says is what we have to live by. And if we don't live by this, we're not living by truth. And we're not living by truth, we will have the judgment that's going to come past. But we have to understand that the only truth that you need to know is his word because it was his blood shed it and it filled the covenant and he covered it and this is what we have to live by. What is truth? Jesus Christ is truth. Well, well how do you tell that to a sinner? Easy. Jesus Jesus Christ is the truth. Y'all hard crowd today. That's okay. I'm going to scream till I ain't got no voice left. We have to understand this. And he is the anchor that we are held by. Be encouraged today, especially those who have fled from their sin and fled from slavery and took a hold of Jesus Christ. There used to be an old song that we did a drama to by Michael English called Holding Out Hope. I don't know. You have to be a little bit older to know that. I don't think anybody under the age of 22 probably would. But it was a simple song, but the drama was very simple. Jesus, the drama started off with Jesus and one individual, and he was talking, and he let that individual go. And all of a sudden, storms came in their life. Temptations came in their life. Bondages came in their life. And all Jesus was doing had his hand out. He was holding out hope. I am your anchor. I don't care how far you have gotten from me. I don't care how many things that's come in your life. My hand is always outstretched to you. I'm holding out hope. All you have to do is fight through the things that you have allowed to pull you away from me. And I am here. We have to understand that. He is firm. He is secure. He is an anchor for our soul. Listen to Psalms 86. Oh, Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. Hebrews 4. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. John chapter 6. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. Psalms 91. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. 
This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Sometimes we have to understand that no matter where we're going, no matter what battle we go to, we got, like they say, you got to doubt 911, Psalms 911, and begin to read. And it says that his faithful promises are your armor and your protection. It didn't say his power. It didn't say his angels. It said his promises. And if his promises are your armor, think about what else he has going for on your side. Think about what else he could do for you when you abide in him and allow him to change you. When you allow him a place in your heart. His promises are your armor. His promises are your protection. He is your strength. All you have to do is hold on to him. Let him be an anchor when the world is trying to pull you away. Let him be an anchor when when the winds are blowing and you have no idea what's going on, he is your anchor that will hold you steadfast. He will keep you stand up. You will build your house upon the rock and not upon the sand because you understand who the rock is. You say a point two is he's an anchor for our soul. Once we have Jesus, we're able to anchor ourselves to him. Listen to this commentator. It says, hope accomplishes for the soul the same thing which an anchor does for a ship. It makes it fast and secure. An anchor preserves a ship when the waves beat and the wind blows. And as long as the anchor holds, so long the ship is safe. And the mariner apprehends no danger. So with the soul of a Christian in the tempest and the trials of life, his mind is calm as long as his hope of heaven is firm. For that gives away. If that gives away, he feels that all is lost. We're tempted in the storms. And in the tempts of life. To hold fast to other things. How many times have you gone through one this, one thing here, one thing over there, and, and all of a sudden your mind begins to drift away from God? You begin to think about how can I help myself? Or, or, or let, me, let me rephrase that. Let's get spiritual. God, how can I help you help me? Right? Because that's what it is, right? Well, God, I know you're busy. I'm going to help you out just a little bit, just a little bit of, little bit of uh, attention over here, and I'll, I'll do the rest. But see, when that begins to happen, we begin to hold fast to other things that we think might keep us safe. But there's only one thing that is pure. There's only one thing in Scripture that says that they cannot lie. It's impossible. It's God. It's His promises. It's His oath. But for now, let's consider how peaceful it must be to sleep and to work on the deck of a ship whose anchor is steadfast and secure. Anybody ever watch that show? Uh, it might still be on uh, Deadly Catch, Deadliest Catch, when they're out in the deep sea uh, fishing for crabs, you know, and they, it's the water's cold and the ship is just going bam, bam, and waves are coming over the top of it about knocking people over. And I think about that. I'm like, some of us feel like that in life. We feel like we're out way out in the middle of the ocean and the storm's coming and that ship is just going and going. Uh, you've probably seen videos where you had huge waves where you had a great big old, big old ship go to the top of the wave and then it drops to the next part of the water. Could you imagine being on that ship? But every one of us are probably like that in our life sometimes. But the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 26, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Even when everything is going bad in life, even when everything is falling apart, even when everything, it, nothing is going right. I am going to trust in my God because he gave me a promise that he's never going to leave me, that he is going to fight the battle for me. And I'm going to have peace within my mind and within my heart because I trust in him. And because I trust in him, he is going to anchor me to himself. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be smooth selling. But it does mean that if I'm anchored 
of him, there's absolutely no way you will ever lose if you're anchored to him. There's no way you will ever fall if you're anchored to him. There's no way that you will ever be thrown out if you're anchored to him. It's obviously not a perfect metaphor, but this is in some way how it feels to be anchored to hope. If you are anchored firm and secure, if your connections are strong and the anchor is trustworthy, the solid and firm without cracks, without defects, without weaknesses, do we find any of that in Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but my anchor is perfect. My anchor has no defects. There is no spot in him. There is no shadow in him. There is no crack in him. There is no wishy-washy in him. He is strong. He is firm. He is steadfast. He is sitting at the right hand of his Father. And he is saying that all I have to do, Father, all you got to do is send me. All you got to do is give me the word and I'm going to go. I am the one that's going to, to bring everyone back to you, Father. He is strong. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. For all is good, you might find yourself saying words like the anchor will hold, or better yet, we're not going anywhere. It's kind of funny. I wrote this, and I, the song came to my mind. Later on that night, I saw Nikki had placed a, a video on, on Facebook, and I went to comment on it. And I got up this morning to see if she commented back. And for some reason, my comment didn't go to her. But she was singing the same song that I wrote down in my sermon. And it's an old song that says the anchor holds. Though the ship is battered, the anchor holds. Though the sails are torn, I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas. The anchor holds in spite of the storm. You have to understand that you are a, a small boat in a big ocean. And the only way that you're ever going to make it to the other side is to understand where your anchor is. To understand that it doesn't matter how many holes you have in your ship. It doesn't matter if you have a cell that is functional. All you need to know is do you have an anchor that's going to hold you still? Do you have an anchor that's going to hold you right where you need to be? And I'm telling you right now, if Jesus Christ is not on your boat, you do not have an anchor that's going to be able to hold you through the problems that you're going through. But if you have that anchor, if you have Jesus Christ right there beside you, no matter what you go through, no matter what kind of despair you might think you have, how bad your heart has been broken, he is going to see you on the other side. Because that is who he is. He is your anchor. We are anchored by the hope that is Jesus Christ. We're confident because of this hope. My final point is this. We are anchored by this hope. With so many uncertainties in the world, with so much turmoil and confusion and division, it is any wonder that our cities and cultures are struggling with epidemic levels of anxiety, stress, and depression. Friends and family and neighbors are literally grasping for anything firm and secure to hold fast. And every time they grab hold of anything other than Jesus Christ, all they got to do is blink their eyes and there's something else that the world is telling you to grab a hold to. There's something else that the world is telling you to grab a hold to. But everything they grab gives way. Hope wrongly applied will often leave us worse off than we started. But think about it. There's more false religions being created today than ever before. People are creating their own personal pronouns so they can feel like they're anchored in a world, in a culture that, that is changing. And anything that you say, I know a teacher, I'm not going to name the, the individual, but I know a teacher that says they have two students. And one identifies as a dog. One identifies as a cat. One identify, and you do anything or whatever else that you can do to try to grab and try to hold. And the enemy has got their mind so confused that the anchor is right in front of them. I try to tell people you have to understand you know back in the day Marilyn Manson was the worst singer there was he was one of these scream metal guys and he got hurt at church and some of his uh, rock shows he would tear the bible and urinate on the bible on, on the stage and during his shows and he just being so just so disrespectful to God and just so sacrilegious and 
And I said, you know, guys, you got to understand, every time he's doing that, Jesus is standing right behind him. Every time he does that, Jesus has his hand out and says, all you got to do is reach out. I'm right here. It doesn't matter how bad they are, what they have done. Jesus Christ is still right there because all he wants to do is touch people's lives. The Bible says that he is not slow to fulfill his promise, but he is patient, not wanting any to perish. It doesn't matter how bad they have defamed his name. It doesn't matter how bad they have cursed him. He is still right there, and all he wants to do is have them reach out to him, and he will become their anchor in life. You have to understand that he is that anchor. Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 through 31, talks about when Jesus walked on water and Peter wanted to walk out with him. And we all know the story, and I'm going to jump to the very end. And we know as long as Peter was looking at Christ, he was walking on top of that water. As long as he was facing the anchor of his life, he was walking and he was able to do everything that Jesus Christ could do. But as soon as he began to look at these other things and began to be impressed by these other things and the waves coming up, he began to sink and sink. And the only thing that he could do was when he began to sink under the sea, he reached out and Jesus reached down and grabbed him because he looked back to the anchor. He wasn't looking away when he began to sink. When he began to sink, when everything began to fall apart, he knew where to look. And I know just like you in your life, when things begin to fall apart, you know where to look. And you know where you go. But I'm asking you, what happens? What gets you there? Has your, has your eyesight gotten away from the anchor? Has, has your mind gotten away from where God wants you to be? He is your anchor. Everything was going well for Peter until he took his eyes off of Jesus. This reminds us to stay locked into Christ and fastened to him. A firm and secure hope. There is nothing else. And since this life is complicated and complex, it's pretty straightforward. An anchor is simple in its design, but it's very powerful. John 1 and 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and full of truth. If the worship team will come. Have you gotten to that place to where your anchor is not Jesus Christ? Have you not found that anchor for your life? Has someone you trusted ever let you down in the past? Has someone ever lied to you or misled you or, or manipulated you? Are you anxious or depressed? Have you felt fearful of people and places and situations? Has this caused you to focus on something or someone else? Does your hope reside where Christ is? And this is my question to you. It's simply this. What is this hope that we're speaking about? Our hope is in Christ. When you go back and you begin to look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, and go down to 19, it says that our hope is in Him. Our hope is the fact that Jesus Christ gave His life. Our hope is the fact that the promises that God gave us our hope, our expectation is what Jesus Christ has already accomplished and what he promised. And we know that whatever he promised will remain. And I want to pray with you today. I'm not sure who this message is for, but I, I took the confirmation of Nikki's video that this was the word for today. And I believe that we get into places and we overcomplicate Jesus. You know, in other translations, when you go to that verse of simplicity, 
that's in Christ. Other translation says your pure devotion. You know, I don't know about you, but being married is extremely simple to me. It's very simple. It's a woman I love, and I want to do everything I can to make her happy. Oh, yeah, I'm very aggravating. But it's simple. I'm going to love her. What does that mean? She gets everything she wants. That's it. I don't matter. And you know what? If you were to ask her, she'll say the same thing. Total devotion. That's the simple relationship that you can have with Jesus Christ. That's all it is. It's not about becoming more educated. It's not about becoming more talented. It's not about becoming more known, knowing more verses in your head, writing this and writing that and doing this and doing that and going on this mission trip and that mission trip. Your relationship with Jesus Christ is simply this. You love him with everything that you have. And if you love him with everything that you have, Every decision that you have will be based on that love you have for him. And some of these things that you struggle with, when you begin to really focus on the anchor in your life that is Jesus Christ, some of these things you struggle with, you won't struggle with anymore. Before you realize, you're going to blink your eyes, and it's going to be two or three years down the road, and that thing is going to be gone. You know, Pastor, I got this bondage. No, you don't have that bondage. You don't. Your devotion is not there. Does that mean you're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. We're going to make mistakes. But it's a simple relationship that we have with Jesus.